Okay, so as the slides are coming up, I'm just going to um, kick off the discussion, and I'm Laura Rodriguez from NHGRI, and I know some of you, but not all of you. Um, and Steve is going to run our slides, so that is why he is standing up there um, for this end, but our speakers are going to um, rotate through the slides. So we're going to start off just to, with Steve to give a basic frame of the issues as we saw it, looking at patient-facing tools um, and associated other topics that were put into this very broad um, set of issues for the hour, and then we'll hear from Janet Williams, who has done a survey of the information that is available out there and looked at the information from different programs, and then we will finally hear from um, Bill Lawrence, who will talk about what we might learn from some work that they've been doing at PCORI, and hopefully that will round us out nicely um, to move into our discussion um, for the hour before lunch. So, Great. Um, thanks, Laura. So uh, we'll, we'll do, as Laura said, we'll do a bit of a tag team on this. I, I guess the first point to make is that um, implementation of genomic medicine into practice is going to take effective uh, clinician-patient communication, and you all know that. And if you look at this iconic uh, diagram from the base pairs to bedside, uh, to bedside paper, uh, the, as you get over to the right side of this diagram, particularly improving the effectiveness of, of healthcare, this isn't going to happen if we don't get the clinician-patient communication, clinician-family communication part of this uh, right. Now, as you all know, uh, there are uh, substantial challenges in uh, doing this. I, I, I hope you'd all agree that the best patient-facing tools or family-facing tools are uh, expert genetic counselors and medical geneticists and others with content expertise uh, in the area, and there's no substitute for that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we don't, we have uh, challenges that are going to make it very difficult to rely on that workforce, as we've been talking about over uh, the course of the morning. So if you think about uh, all of the things that genetic uh, counselors do, this from the National Society of Genetic Counselors website, uh, genetic counseling is the process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychosocial, and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease, including interpretation of family and medical histories to assess the chance of disease occurrence, uh, education about inheritance, testing, management, prevention, uh, et cetera and counseling to promote informed choices and adaptation to risks or condition. And in some sense, that's what we ask of our genetics professionals and our broader clinician workforce, uh, but we can't uh, rely on that workforce because of the challenges that face us. There just isn't enough, and so we need tools to make that uh, possible. Some of the specific uh, challenges include the scale of the issue as uh, genomic medicine or genetic medicine moves out from uh, specialty settings into the general medical setting. Uh, the workforce demands are just going to be overwhelmed. Uh, secondly, the, the scope of uh, genomic medicine as we move from targeted to much more broad uh, sequencing or genomic testing, the potential findings that may come back become so broad uh, that it becomes very challenging with our traditional models of education and counseling and decision support uh, to address them. Uh, and finally, of course, the issues of uh, science and genetics literacy. We've been talking over the last hour about this from the perspectives of uh, clinicians. We all realize this is a challenge from the perspectives of patients and families and the public as well. So if you think about the um, functions of patient-facing uh, tools, this is uh, crude, but to, I want to break it down into uh, pretest and post-test settings. Uh, I think there are three broad ones, one of which is uh, education of uh, patients and families, the second is risk assessment, and the third is decision support. And the education may be uh, education that's related for the indication uh, that we are considering doing this particular test, and then some preemptive education related to the possibility of incidental or secondary findings. Risk assessment is going to relate to phenotype and personal as well as family history. Uh, and decision support includes things like whether to test and then possibly, and, and I put a question mark here because I don't think our community is settled on how we're going to deal with this issue, but possibly uh, the question of preferences for the return of incidental or secondary findings. In the uh, post-test uh, setting, again, we have uh, challenges related to education, risk assessment, and decision support. Uh, for education, there's, of course, education related to the primary result that uh, comes back, uh, education related to any secondary or incidental findings that come back, uh, particularly educational challenges related to variants of uncertain significance, uh, if and when those are reported back. And something we actually haven't talked a lot about over the course of this meeting, but the challenges of negative tests and what those mean, particularly when you're talking about uh, broad sequencing. 
Risk assessment again becomes a problem, particularly in the setting of secondary incidental findings. Hopefully you've done a good risk assessment up front for the, sort of the thing that's relevant to the indication for your test, but you certainly haven't or, or unlikely to have done a complete risk assessment for uh, one of the thousands of possible secondary findings that might come back. And so now at the time of that finding coming back is the time to do that risk assessment. And then uh, again, uh, decision support, both res with respect to any uh, diagnostic, therapeutic, or preventive interventions that might be related to the results. Uh, and then of course, what are we gonna do about family members who might be implicated as well? So uh, just to sort of set the stage and then I'll turn it over to Janet, uh, there is a clear need I think for uh, effective, safe, uh, and efficient, uh, needs for, uh, there are things that we need in order to be able to effectively, safely, and efficiently implement uh, genomic medicine, and that includes a whole suite of uh, patient-facing tools, uh, strategically designed uh, suite of tools that are directed at patients, and many of these tools are really going to be designed to uh, support and extend clinicians who are practicing uh, genomic medicine, including both the uh, genetic and genomic specialists, uh, non-genetic specialists uh, in my own world of oncology, uh, the general, there's a, a subset of oncologists who really are experts in high risk or inherited cancer syndromes, but most oncologists really are not truly expert in those things, and for them it's a significant challenge, and I, I think this is true across most areas of uh, medical specialization, and then of course uh, primary care clinicians. So with that, let me turn it over to Janet. You're welcome to come on up, Janet, and um, run the slides from here. And it is this yeah, space bar. So um, my task uh, in our work group, our panel, was to take a look at some of the tools out there that are designed for patients um, and that uh, provide them with education or with the means to uh, understand genomics. And um, although a bit um, tongue in cheek, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was to just kind of take a look at where would patients go to find information, and in talking with patients, the, you know, the place they go is to the internet, and if you're just trying to find out information about what is genomics, what does it mean, um, I didn't evaluate every one of these, but it, um, it is uh, pretty daunting to uh, just get an explanation of what's involved. In looking at the um, funded projects uh, that are represented here in the room, again, I did some perusing mainly on websites, um, had uh, a little bit of, of background information about resources that have been published, and there's much more out there than I could show here. But some of the top um, items that are referenced in terms of pa patient education or patient resources include, uh, I think, uh, first and foremost, Genetics Home Reference, which has um, played a large role, I think, in providing uh, patient-oriented information. Um, I think that many of the oncology folks are well familiar with the Cancer Genetics PDQ out of NCI, and that's been very helpful uh, also in uh, providing background information for clinicians as well as for patients. Uh, the new resource, Genome Connect, is uh, looking to be a great source of information for the new types of genome findings that are coming out, uh, in, uh, although they also are, um, will likely be one of those uh, resources that are connected to many of our projects. Um, Genetic Alliance is mentioned many times, Medline Plus is mentioned, um, and then of course the um, uh, National uh, Rare Diseases uh, Group is mentioned, and then Orphanet, which is really more a European site that's available. So these are resources that uh, patients can go to when they're looking primarily for specific information on a specific disease. It's less oriented towards providing resources or tools for patients to understand if they want to do uh, genome sequencing or how that might benefit their family, um, how they might understand uh, genome uh, sequencing or genome information, and then also how they might communicate information with their families. A couple of these tools, which are, which are actually tools that help to explain results for patients, include um, Lab Tests Online, which is a very generic sort of tool, but it includes genetic results. Uh, you heard about the um, CERC uh, uh, project on my results uh, formulated by John Connolly at CHOP um, with input from the CERC members of eMERGE. 
uh, is another patient resource place to enter um, genome information and have uh, support that comes back. Um, there's a web resource, yourgenome.org, that again can, is patient facing. I wanted to highlight the My46 uh, out of the University of Washington, only because it really is a more total tool for patients. Um, it does enable you to um, upload your results, to um, have information about what was found in those results. Um, it will uh, help support you in terms of any single gene testing, exome sequencing, or whole genome uh, sequencing. It does offer the process of dynamic consent, something I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but it also then facilitates researchers um, to uh, be able to, again, look at how patients select uh, the results that they wish to receive and how the results can be managed and uh, how patients might use that information that they learn from this tool. Um, I will say that um, in addition, uh, Genome Connect is also offering that resource to researchers as a means to link patients and researchers. One of the things I wanted to lift up was, uh, again, the work we've been doing re with regard to our whole genome sequencing project, which is looking at tying patient results to clinician uh, results uh, in, within the electronic health record and providing an interface for these um, tools to uh, be available both for patients and clinicians at the same time. In terms of our um, patient qualitative work, I think it's important to recognize the themes that at least the patients within our whole genome sequencing project identified. And that is that patients who have a child with an undiagnosed disease uh, do embark on this um, ongoing continual search for valid information and resources. They do that now through the internet and see that as both a blessing and a curse. Um, that prior reports on genetic results are not adequate for or, and are not helpful to patients. And of course, they weren't designed to be patient uh, directed. Um, but parents expressed a need for a report that they could understand. And they emphasized that the, a report that was designed for them would be something that they could use for communication, both with their uh, other providers. Many of these children tend to have multiple providers um, because they have uh, multiple um, uh, health uh, conditions and they're chronic utilizers of the healthcare system, but they also described how they would use a genome report uh, with uh, explaining uh, the findings and the diagnosis to family, to friends, to their schools in the context of an ed uh, individualized educational program assessment, um, and then again with other physicians as well. And they outlined the things that they were looking for in a genome report designed for patients, and that is, of course, understandable language, a logical flow, some visual appeal, information on what to expect in the future, what's the prognosis that's associated with this genome finding, um, and then what are the next steps that should be taken. Uh, and uh, finally, that they would love to see the option for different ways of receiving that report. We are proposing it through the patient portal in my Geisinger, but our patients do have some connectivity issues in central Pennsylvania and suggested that perhaps they could also receive it um, on a thumb drive um, or a phone app or something that enabled them to have that information uh, that wasn't necessarily tied to internet connectivity. Uh, I wanted to highlight um, the um, CSER project in, the, in terms of the work that they're doing on genetic counseling uh, and uh, specifically evaluating uh, genetics counselors' uh, work with patients in the um, space on returning genome results, but also in the work that they're doing on developing patient-facing um, educational materials and uh, the publications, I think they'll be an important group to continue to watch. Um, I thought it was also interesting as I was looking at different um, options uh, for patient education that one of the things that the Gen Genetic Alliance in the UK has done is to develop a patient charter. And that they outlined, um, again, the support that patients, uh, that they found their patients had for genetic counseling. 
uh, that they recommend uh, actually through this genetic alliance in the UK that all patients should be able to access a dedicated genetic counselor before they have their genome sequenced. Uh, and that there should be more support given to the training of genetic counselors um, as the need for their services increases. And I couldn't support that more, being a genetic counselor, but I'd also like to announce that there are at least 10 new genetic counseling programs um, currently in development um, that should be online again within the next year or two. Um, again, out of this patient charter that was actually established uh, in February of this year, um, they noted how patients do welcome the sharing of their genomic data for research purposes. I think that's encouraging for all of us in the room. Um, and that they encourage researchers then to engage with the patient community in order to develop accurate and comprehensive information regarding genome sequencing. And that we need to make an effort within our research studies and in delivering our clinical care um, in order to uh, involving genome sequencing to more closely reflect what patients experience with that information uh, in terms of how we communicate uh, the information. Finally, I wanted to just briefly touch on the issues of, of counseling and consent. I think that there's been quite a bit of work done in, in the realm of consent within research. We don't have standards uh, that are accepted for uh, consent for genome sequencing. Um, but I think that the process of taking that from a research setting into consent in the clinical setting is even more onerous. Um, we talk about clinicians not having time to evaluate the results that come back. They also don't have time to spend in the consent process ahead of time. So we need to think critically about how do we accomplish this um, in the setting of clinical care. Um, Within the uh, Genome uh, Alliance, the UK, as they talked over um, with their genome researchers, they um, actually, this was out of the Hastings Center report, but it was also um, uh, alerted to in the Genome Alliance, um, Genomic Alliance UK, that routine approaches to consent for genome sequencing are probably not effective and that it will require in innovative approaches to ensure decisions that are informed and meaningful. And this is where the issue of dynamic consent and the idea of, of revisiting consent as uh, the context for the individual changes. Um, and that con context may then influence uh, what a, a, an individual patient or a family may want to know. And I believe um, that's all that I'm going to be talking about. I think I'm next going to turn it over now to Bill uh, and talking about PCORI. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm going to sort of present a view from an outsider, uh, and I want to start uh, with uh, just a brief, uh, roughly two-minute explanation of uh, PCORI, as I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with them. I'll try and actually keep that literal on the uh, two minutes. Uh, but just a little overview first. Uh, the purpose of our institute, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, uh, is to assist patients, clinicians, purchasers, and policymakers in making informed health decisions, uh, basically through the provision of evidence and evidence synthesis. So not only are we talking about providing primary research, but talking about providing that research in context through like systematic reviews, things like that. So synthesizing across the, uh, the evidence. And so our big interest is trying to help people make decisions about their care. Uh, we put this within a oh, space bar, right? Um, oh boy. Uh, we, we put this within the context of comparative effectiveness research, uh, essentially comparing what your options are available uh, or what your options are available at any particular decision point and actually comparing uh, the benefits and harms of them. And part of that is actually making sure that we're disseminating research findings to clinicians, to patients, and to other stakeholders. Um, just a brief thing on who we are on the science side. Uh, we have uh, five science programs. 
the assessment of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment options, which is uh, informally known as our uh, Comparative Effectiveness Research Group. This, these are the folks who, if you're thinking about actually comparing uh, two different approaches to testing, uh, various interventions that you're probably going to be looking at. Our Improving Health Healthcare Systems uh, group looks at uh, different systems approaches to helping patient care. Uh, so thinking about trying to put things within the context of a plan, different types of care management approaches, things like that. The Communication Dissemination Research Group, of which I'm a part, is actually interested in looking at different ways of disseminating, disseminating information to patients uh, so that we can actually improve decision making. We also have an Addressing Disparities group uh, looking at how do we uh, improve care for vulnerable populations. Uh, and then finally, our methodologic research group, uh, which, ha which funds basic methodologic uh, studies in comparative effectiveness research, and it's also our data infrastructure group. Uh, that sponsors uh, PCORnet, uh, which has both clinical and patient-oriented uh, research organizations, which I believe some of you are members of. Spacebar, Spacebar. I will remember Spacebar. Um, so, pa so part of uh, our uh, mandate here is talking about how do we get information out to patients to actually improve their decision making and again that's sort of in my uh, group and our basic uh, our, our basic tenet is that pr producing the information is not enough we've got to get it out uh, to all audiences uh, and in general, uh, the information itself is of little use unless it reaches those who need it and it's clear and comprehensible uh, to those who are receiving it. Uh, and so with that, I just wanted to give a few thoughts uh, from uh, other areas in which we've done decision-making work uh, and hopefully uh, this might be uh, useful at thinking going forward. Uh, with your programs. So moving towards the development of decision-making tools, and I put content in here too. Uh, counseling, genetic counseling is a very important, uh, uh, a very important approach, uh, but it's also important to understand what that content is in the counseling. Uh, so uh, I want to make the comments both on sort of tools, both patient-facing tools and on counseling. So the content basically, number one, the way we look at it is it's based upon the evidence linking choices to patient-relevant outcomes. Uh, so in thinking about it, uh, what we're looking for is information. If you're doing the test and that, or thinking about doing the test, does actually doing that improve someone's health, longevity, some other sort of patient-relevant outcome. We're looking for methodologically rigorous studies, uh, probably the most relevant group in thinking about this for helping patients to make decisions is the International Patient Decision Aid Society, or uh, excuse me, International Patient Decision Aid Standards uh, group, and that may be one resource to look to. Uh, involve patients and clinicians throughout the process of developing and evaluating the tools. And one of the things that uh, I will try and harp upon is uh, stakeholder engagement writ large. People should be involved in the research at the start of the research. Don't bring them in at the end to say, how do you help uh, disseminate this? Um, it should be accessible to patients, which I have, there are two forms of accessible. Uh, number one, it should be available. If they can't find it, it's useless. Uh, and it's got to be understandable. And here, uh, there are big issues in terms of health literacy and health numeracy. I was at a decision, uh, decision science meeting last week where a uh, uh, investigator presented data that uh, she surveyed a group of patients out of clinic and, and uh, started with the question that, John uh, was supposed to take his pills on empty stomach but ate lunch. And the directions say, well, you can take it two hours after the meal. 
when should he take his pills, 40% of people couldn't answer that question. So things to be thinking about as you move forward, uh, making sure that it's accessible to a wide range of patients. Um, it should be or responsive to patients' needs and preferences. Uh, so basically, helping to inform choices based upon preferences as opposed to dictating what you want them to do. Uh, and then finally, evaluate it. Does it actually work? Um, so just a couple of thoughts moving past development. And PCORI doesn't really fund development of decision-making tools and such, but we are interested, once you have some basic efficacy data, on actually comparing them in real-world situations. Uh, and that may be one way we can talk about interface between NHRGI and uh, PCORI. Uh, but with translation into the real world settings, I'm a primary care doc, how are you gonna get me to use this? And are my patients gonna understand it? Uh, will it get used? Do you have buy-in from the relevant stakeholders? Again, uh, if I don't know to use it as a primary care doc, then chances are my patients aren't gonna use it. Uh, for the decision tools, who maintains them? Uh, we've talked a little bit within the group about doing repositories of uh, the tools and such. This is a rapidly evolving uh, field, and there's a lot of impetus to developing the tools, but when things change, there's not a whole lot of impetus to update the tools, so who maintains them? And then finally, do the tools actually improve decision making, and does it improve patient outcomes, which is really what we're looking for? And are there general points here? All right. Do you want to?